Howdy folks, Craig Villotti here at the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bones Zoomcast. This episode, we're talking to Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbrogen, and he is uh, also known as just, well, Merriweather. And uh, his job is to talk to people about all of the amazing edible plants that are all around us in Texas and beyond. It's a very nutritious and a very uh, enlightening episode. Howdy folks, Craig Levati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Beyond Bones Zoomcast. Of course, as always, I am joined by my co-host sitting there in a green shirt. That's Kat Havens. Hello. Kat, how you doing? I'm doing really good. I'm, I'm excited about today. How are you doing? I am very good. I'm very excited to talk to, uh, well, this is a giant <laughs> in the uh, foraging world here in the Houston area, of course. Uh, he's got a long name, so I need to I need to actually get my notepad out. <laughs> this is Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderbrogen, PhD, also known as uh, what the Medicine Man. Um, you are uh, you are your your footprint on Google is massive. I had a good time doing research on you. Uh, you run the website Foraging Texas and also MedicineManPlantCo.com. On uh, Saturday, October 2nd at 9.30 a.m., you are going to be teaching a class at HMS inside the Moran Hall downstairs in the in the basement, all about how you can forage for edible things in Texas. And it's a, something that's really exciting for us, especially the class actually is going to be inside. And then I guess, obviously, if weather permits, you guys are going to be walking around the McGovern Gardens next door and around the museum to see exactly what is edible out there for people to sort of just pick off the vine and, and, and test and try something I've always been really excited about. Even when I was little riding dirt bikes around Pearland, I would find honeysuckle, dewberries, I would, dewberries and things like that. You know, it was always, you know, uh, my dad showed me honeysuckles, so he knew about a lot of things like that. So, uh, so Meriwether just, Give us a rundown. Like, is there a lot of edible stuff in, in Houston? Can we just walk down the street and pick some stuff off? OK, around? that how, how does it work? How does that work? All right. So uh, just just to put the class that's coming up for the HMS there, uh, we'll spend 20 to 30 minutes inside the classroom where I'll just go over the rules and ethics of foraging. Then we're heading outside and walking around the building. I've spent a lot of time on your grounds. There are a lot of edible plants there, especially as we are entering the fall season. A lot of the traditional edible weeds that people learn about are summertime weeds up north, but wintertime weeds down here in the south. So if you've ever read My Side of the Mountain or you know, books like that, Hatchet, those are the plants we'll be finding, a lot of the weeds around there. So yes, there's lots and lots and lots of edible and medicinal plants all over the Houston area. The issue is the laws covering yeah. it. The Texas has a unique history. Uh, some of its history is rather filled with blood. Going back to, say, the sheep and cattle wars of the 1800s, these led to such fascinating things as the invention of barbed wire fences and repeating revolvers. They also, because of the bloodshed, it was kind of the Texas government took the quick and easy parental way of dealing with this. said, OK, if you guys can't share this, I'm taking it away from you. And what this means now is to harvest plants from a piece of property in Texas, you need the plant owner's permission. So theoretically, if you are walking down the sidewalk in Houston, uh, you would need the property owner's permission to pick a weed or something from, you know, any plant or mushroom from that piece of property. Or Luckily, uh, the class, something like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Luckily, okay. During the class, we have the permission. So we will actually be able to harvest things. We will be harvesting in a very sustainable and safe manner. Uh, that will be covered at the, 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 at the beginning of the class, the, you know, the ethics of foraging. From a legal standpoint, the only public area where you are allowed to harvest plants without really asking permission is along roadsides. Hmm. Yeah, same as fossils. Ah, okay, exactly. Yeah, like fossil uh, whiskey bridge over in College mm -hmm. Station and so forth. But uh, every spring, the Texas Department of Public Safety issues a white paper that basically is titled, Yes, You Can Pick the Blue Bonnet, Stop Calling Us, Damn It, <laughs> which isn't exactly 
the title, but as you read it through, you start to pick up. Yeah, that's their attitude. So yeah, along roadsides, you are allowed to harvest the aerial parts of plants. You can't dig things up. Right. You can harvest the aerial parts. And what I recommend people is just take seeds and plant them someplace where you have you know actual Permission. access to free reign to do it yourself. Yeah. And you're yeah, on the your side yard, of the you know. Thing. Side note, that is interesting that you mentioned blue bonnets, because when I was a reporter, that was always the big myth that we always had to dispel is that you're not supposed to pick them. You're not you shouldn't pick them, but it, you, it's not there's no law against it. You, you, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you'd be a jerk if you did it. I was always <laughs> so told we that you weren't allowed there. to. And then I was very, like, very much sure I was going to jail as a six year old <laughs> for picking one. And my older brother convinced me that yeah that was going to be like five years and they were going to take me away from my parents it's like uh, that old thing in the peewee and it was a peewee's big uh-huh. adventure and the guy was talking about i cut the mat i caught the tag off i cut the tag, the off, tag off the mattress, mattress. Yeah, yeah, yeah that kind yeah, of thing yeah. um but there's the foraging thing has always been interesting to me going back like i said when my childhood you know riding on a motorbike finding stuff on the side how did you start how, how did you how did you so, get to the point where you're you know you're Meriwether the Forger. Guy. <laughs> How does one so, become a uh, man? <laughs> so you need to have really cool outdoorsy parents. Perfect. But both my parents were children of the Great Depression, and one of the ways up in Minnesota, and one of the ways the small farming communities got through that terrible time was through the knowledge of wild edible plants and mushrooms, and you know, edible and medicinal. My mom hates the fact that I teach these classes. She's horribly embarrassed by it because oh, that's what poor people do. And it's like, uh, no, it's what cool people do. There you yeah. go. So it actually started when I moved down to Texas. Uh, that was in 1997. I'm big into outdoors. I love hiking and camping and all that sort of thing. And at the time, the internet was just kind of getting a foothold and there was no web page devoted to where to do outdoor activities in Texas. And so I built a blog and each weekend I'd go to some different place and you know do the wild stuff there and then come back and do a write up on it. But the posts that really got people intrigued was when I mentioned occasionally finding this plant or that plant and, oh, you can use it for this and that. It got to the point where people started emailing and say, hey, we're going camping next weekend. Uh, You you don't know us, but would you come with us? (laughs) Is it going to be beer? Okay, let's go. You know, and so I started doing that. And then in 2008, uh, the Houston Arboretum contacted me and they said, hey, we hear you teach people about wild edible plants. Would you mind teaching a class on that for us? And it's like, yeah, okay, sure, we'll do that. So I did one in the fall, 2008, and then another in the spring. And then the demand was so big that basically they had me there every month, almost until COVID started. Wow. So just just teaching there. And then from there, it exploded. I got the book deal. Every state park and historic site and museum and everything is contacting me. I'm wearing myself out. <laughs> well, the po- it's a the- popular topic. I know we talked before we got on here yeah. that I've had classes like for kids, kiddos, and your kids were some of those mm-hmm. um, about edible plants, especially from a medicinal point of view. And I've had to do one for every era, like ancient middle ages and more modern because they fill up they're popular. Yeah. You know, and it's been such a thing throughout history. Yeah. So and I'm, I like, I, I'm, oh. inter- I'm just, I'm just going to say too, I would be worried about foraging in the Houston area because of pesticides. Um, and at the, in our Cocker Butterfly Center and all of our educational materials and stuff, we definitely preach against people using pesticides and anything sort of nasty inside their own yards because, you know, we're, we're trying to become, uh, you know, butterfly, you know, charging Definitely. stations you know it's a so yeah how does that work when you're trying to forage how do you know whether or not something hasn't already been tainted okay so that's a really good question yeah. and uh there this is going to be kind of a long answer but okay. uh one thing there has actually been studies on the wild plants found in boston and in the twin cities minneapolis and st paul up in minnesota to check for feared contamination, the urban environment contamination, they found that there was no issues. Uh, In fact, the plants, the weeds along the sidewalks and empty lots and stuff in Boston, Minneapolis and St. Paul all tested better uh, for pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals and all that than a lot of the garden vegetables. Okay. So there's that. Now, Houston is a little different because we have a bigger... uh, 
you know, chemical plant type thing. But even then, I've been trying to find someone to do some studies on this to look at it. But so far, I uh, haven't gotten anyone that has the spare money lying around to, to test it here. <laughs> that was just but, one thing I was always worried about. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, it's possible. But then I know that ecologically here in Texas, here in Houston, especially, you know, they, they call us the chemical coast for a reason. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's better it's, safe it's, than sorry. Yeah. yeah. So and actually one of the biggest issues is the way our sewer system is set up. Hmm. because our storm sewers and our sanitary sewers are linked. So during our many flooding situations in Houston, everything that people have flushed down their toilets has now come out of the storm drains and is deposited on the, the yeah. areas in the air. So an area that has been flooded, I tell people, you want to let the sun and just regular rain, you know, decontaminate that for eight months minimum before you harvest anything there. Going to the pesticides, yes, that's another thing. And that's one of the reasons why, even if it were legal to harvest in city parks, you probably don't want to harvest in city parks because they don't want fire ants there. You know, they don't want the, the bugs eating their, their plants, so they spray the stuff down. The basic rule of thumb when it comes to how long does it take a pesticide to be reduced down to safe levels is if you look on the package, whatever the active lifespan of the pesticide is, you have to double that. So like Ooh. not to pick on Andrew once a year, but their title says Andrew once a year fire end killer. You got to wait two years before you can really. Uh, harvest anything where that's been spread to be on the safe side. Now, there are certain indicator plants that you can use to help determine if an area is safe. Uh, the two big ones are Spanish moss and ball moss. Because Spanish moss and, and ball moss, they are not parasites. These are the, you know, the drapey things on the yeah. trees. They just use the trees as support. They are not taking any nutrients from the trees. They are taking everything from the air from the air and the moisture and some of the dust that lands on them. If they are healthy, that means the air is clean. If the air is clean, that means the soil very likely is clean because that's where most of the contaminants come from, falling from the sky. So if you got Spanish moss or ball moss growing, that's a very, very strong indicator that the area is clean. Also lichen. Like in, you know, the stuff growing on the, the cement walls and so forth. That is actually a symbiotic relationship between bacteria and fungi. It sounds like something you want to kill with Lysol, but it's actually very nutritious. You do have to treat it in a special way, but it is another indicator of a healthy ecosystem because it, it is very susceptible to toxins. Disc looking, disc looking yeah, growth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A little crusty. In Egypt too. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're loaded with vitamin C and loaded with calories, but they're also loaded with organic acid that will make you uh, stick to your stomach if you don't neutralize that. Ah, that makes sense. Do they do they taste like mushrooms? Because they look like they would taste like they taste like seaweed. Really? Yeah. I mean, the base seaweed is just giant sheets of algae, you know, of, of bacteria. So yeah, it's like mushroomy seaweed. <laughs> That's we were awesome talking, we were talking, I think a few, oh man, which I don't know. This was, I know definitely an episode of, of Beyond Bones. We were talking to somebody about sustainable food and that, you know, it was one day, Stephanie, I think too. Yeah. Was. And one day we're going to start needing to, you know, with population growth and everything and just resources that stuff that, that, that Meriwether's talking about, is going to be very, um, well, it's going to be vital for everybody. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of food security and knowing, mm -hmm. you know, what plants around you, you can eat. Exactly. Yeah. What, so what are some of the things here? I guess if you were going to uh, make, make one of us, make us dinner. Salad. You know, yeah. What, what are the stuff that you, what's kind of stuff in Houston you could find? or the Houston? Oh area? boy. Okay. So wood sorrel is a big one. A okay. lot of people mistake wood sorrel for a clover, but it's not. Wood sorrel, if you think the shamrock from St. Patrick's Day, that is not a clover. That is a wood sorrel, oxalis species. It has the three heart-shaped leaves, mm -hmm. whereas the clovers, those leaves are actually round or oblong. But those three heart-shaped leaves have a, the, the, the wood sorrel, have a wonderful tangy sort of flavor. It's good raw. It is very good mixed with a cream soup. 
because mm. you get this creaminess and this tanginess going on. It's very good whipped into butter because it ends up tasting like a lemon butter sort of thing. So you would cool. use it wherever you are using lemon. Lemon and butter dish. are my two favorite. Those are my two favorite. Yeah, things. I was going to yeah. say, you're talking Heck our yeah. language, <laughs> speaking our language now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cream lemon soup butter. is high on my yep. list. Yep. And I'll tell you, if you, you grab a handful of about a quarter cup of the oxalis or the wood sorrel, and even, they make, uh, they sell landscaping oxalis and it, they still have that, you know, triangular heart shaped sort of shape. They may be purple or something like that. Very, excuse me, very, very good. Um, mixing them with the soup is pr probably my favorite way of doing it, butter being the second. Uh, one important thing, the tangy lemony flavor is due to a comp compound called oxalic acid now when oxalic acid is floating around in your blood it's fine the problem is is when it encounters a calcium ion in your blood at that point it forms calcium oxalate which is no longer soluble in your blood and so your kidneys filter it out now if you're drinking plenty of water and generally treating yourself right moving a lot things like that the small crystals will be flushed out before they form big crystals. Mm, it makes so, sense. Yeah. Now, if you go back to the butter, butter is a dairy product high in calcium. In that case, the oxalic acid will bind with the calcium in your gut and just pass on through without causing a problem. Uh -huh. So having the oxalic acid, you know, having some cheese or cottage cheese or things like that uh, improves it even more. It makes it safe to eat. Something it's already bind, safe to eat something to bind it i guess sort of to flush it out okay yeah to keep it out of the bloods out of the kidneys and just keep it in the intestines because the calcium oxalate will not pass through the intestinal wall it just right it's exits. too big to go through to be absorbed so it's just eliminated yeah uh, okay you're, you're 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 triggering the chemist in me <laughs> i knew i was going to trigger the chemist yeah he is and a so PhD. it's not a, it's not a size thing it's it's molecular structure thing okay the body has no use for oxalic acid, so it's not even going to take it into that. So it goes, yeah. go along, move along. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, interesting. Another really good one right now is purslane. Purslane is this red succulent looking weed that you find growing up through the sidewalk cracks in your driveway and your sidewalk uh, during the hottest, you know, August and September and July months. Wonderful, wonderfully nutritious weed. It tastes good. It has a slightly salty flavor. It has a nice crunch to it. I like to describe the flavor as a slightly salted celery, which oh. is hard to say three times fast. Slightly salted <laughs> celery. Yeah, but uh, you can just eat it raw. You can chop it up, mix it with scrambled eggs. The Native Americans in the area, they would mix it with the, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the different birds eggs or turtle eggs. Mm -hmm. One of the, the claims to fame about the purslane that makes it so good is it is one of the few plant... Uh, well, a few plant forms of the omega-3 fatty acid, which is critical for heart health and brain yes. health. So it's highly recommended if you're vegans to get the, the fatty acids that you're, you're not getting from the animal fats. Right. The person is a okay. wonderful source of it. Hmm. I will also tell you, if you are the type of person who does not like a lot of other people, but <laughs> say your work is constantly having potlucks, you go, you collect the, the purslane because the stems are red and thick. You take off the leaves, then you pickle them using the ball blue book of canning and preserving, making pickled okra stems, which once they're done, they look a lot like earthworms. Oh, cool. And so you show up with your jar of pickled earthworms and you For will never. For Halloween parties. Well, yeah, that too. I suppose. <laughs> or in your Bloody Mary, even better. Ooh, there you go. But it retains the omega-3 fatty acids and the other nutrients. But it's just a fun party trick, if nothing mm. else. Huh. That so that's awesome. a good one. Um, soon we will have bittercress, the hoary bittercress, which is a wonderful little horseradishy tasting weed. Mm, if you like horseradish, um, yeah. it's all brought very soon. It's going to start showing up in the shadier, damper areas, like on the north side of the building. And it's really cool. I, I love it as another example of food chemistry. Because if you think horseradish, you think that pungent flavor, very, very strong. 
the thing is, when you, you when you first take it and start chewing it, it just has kind of a green flavor. It doesn't have any horseradish flavor, and the people are usually a little disappointed. They go, "Well, where's the horse? Oh, there it is!" Because yeah. the actual molecule responsible for the horseradish flavor is the reaction product of a compound in the plant with the water and oxygen. So when you're chewing it and rupturing the plant cells, you're opening it up, these chemicals can now float around, encounter the water, encounter the oxygen, and then turn into that horseradish flavor. That's so cool. it's it's not in the plant itself, it's a molecule that gets turned into it. Another very common one around, especially uh, around the museum is shepherd's purse, which is that. another member of the mustard family. It has a very unique uh, seed structure. Well, all mustards have a spiral, they have a stalk, and then the seed pods spiral down it. But its seed pods are again, it's called shepherd's purse, because if you think way back in the olden, say, biblical times, the shepherds carried their meager coins in a little leather drawstring bag mm -hmm. that was kind of triangular. That's what the seed pods look like. They look like that leather bag that the shepherds had. And this is really good because it has a wonderful flavor. It has that horseradish flavor again. But it's also a very potent coagulator. So oh. if you are bleeding, you mash up the the shepherd's purse, apply it to the wound, and it triggers the proteins in the blood, the coagulation proteins, to start coagulating. Oh, it can even be used. Virus. Yeah, it can be used in internal bleeding too. Especially how you know, did we like how it, did we get away from all this? That's this is probably a, another really weighty question. But oh, oh, my, that's a beautiful question. Yeah, you know, because you're you're describing all these things that are you know found in the wild or you know the wilds of Houston, and then you mentioned something that's a coagulant. Yeah. How did we get to the point where we sort of pushed all this stuff aside and we were using more? Uh, I know, over the counter things like how did we get to that point? Where... Okay, okay. To do that, Here let's we go, go back. Go. Oh, let's... excited! I am because this is my absolute favorite topic. So to do yeah, this, yeah. we have to go back in time. So we're back in time. I'll let John use some we're, effects in there. Yeah, just waviness. <laughs> so now let's, let's say we're about a million years in the past. If you look at humans, intelligent, tool using, fire controlling hominoids. There's records of us or us, the our ancestors going back as much as 2.5 million years ago, modifying rocks, making fire, making clothing. And well, there's not much record, but it's assumed that they were using plants and mushrooms as medicinal properties. And even at least by Cro Magnum times and Peking Man times, you know, even before human, there are enough indications from resi uh, residue and pots and so forth that they were harvesting plants that had little food value but high medicinal properties. Uh, Utsi, the. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, he, he had he, mushrooms. Uh, he had mushrooms. These mushrooms, there's actually an argument over those mushrooms because they are known to be extremely antimicrobial and used for treating wounds, but they are also that particular species like of mushrooms. Egg. Well, no, those are yeah. some other ones. They are uh, very good tinder. Oh. There are certain mushrooms that are one of the few natural products that will take a spark from you know banging two rocks together and grow it into an ember. Okay, I've so never heard there, that. Yeah, so there's two two possibilities, you know, on so arguing what the mushrooms are. What's your hypo favorite hypothesis? Is it was it medicine or tinder in his, Uzi the Ice Man's case? I, I will use a word my wife uses very often when produce when having to make a choice. Both. Uh, I love that. <laughs> Why not both? Why not? But you know, if you if you have to carry everything you own. You're going to make sure everything has multiple uses. That is so awesome. I mean, because that, that absolutely makes sense. Yeah. So, okay, going back to medicinal plants and mushrooms. So, Homo sapiens has been around for 83,000 generations. And then if you go back to our ancestors leading up to that, there's that history of using the plants and medicines or plants and mushrooms as medicines. If you think about evolution, survival of the fittest, those that responded best to the plant medicines were probably the most fit past these genes on. So we are predisposed from an evolutionary standpoint to respond to these plants and mushrooms as medicine. Now we leap forward to 1836. 
And that's kind of the dawn of the chemical age. A lot of German scientists were trying to recreate different dyes, messing with molecules, making them. And they came up with a thing called chloral hydrate, yeah. which turned out to be a very strong sedative anesthetic. anesthetic. And so the scientists, hey, wait, we made a molecule that affects the humans. This is awesome. Well, hey, screw you, nature. We got it from here, yeah. you know, and because one of the issues with uh, plant medicines and wild plants and so forth is they can be a little inconsistent yeah. in the concentration. So there's usually uh, a little dialing in of things. We're, we're better at it now, but. Um, so like the Victorian age kind of turned towards science and patent medicines and all of that kind of thing. Yeah, well, and, yeah, and just the I'm science saying. side, it was we now have control of nature. We can do it better than nature does it itself. <laughs> and that that's led the point I was getting at. Is that I think that was that was we started to industrialize these mm -hmm. things that in nature are found to be way more. It's just mass marketed. We can mass market things. We can put things in a jar, put a label on it build yep. it and make it in a factory and then and guarantee out there. the purity yep. and guarantee how much yep. is in there and all that kind of thing and that's exactly right if you are medicating the masses you need mass-produced medications yep it's as simple as that because if you're going back to the plants there's a lot of labor and uncertainty and weather and all this stuff that comes into play so if you want to do a lot of it really cheaply mass produce the, the the individual molecules rather than harvest the same plant so yeah the the mass produced medicine medicine for the masses the, the elite still look at the plants <laughs> there the herbs the mushrooms well and you're yeah. going to pay more going to a compounding pharmacy where somebody has to mix up something for you mm -hmm. specifically than if you go to the walgreens or yep. CBS. Yep. So it's another little sort so, of. So yeah, just the more people, the harder it is to supply them with the, what they need, unless it's factory That's done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's. Have you? Uh, you're you're bringing up all these really cool um, ingredients, you know, for foods and stuff. Have you ever been approached, or have you ever approached a restaurant here in Houston and said, "Let's have a night where we just uh, we eat foraged mm -hmm. foods." Yeah. In fact, there was a chef here, Randy Rucker. Randy. That, yes. I yes. was good friends with Randy. He's yes, up in yes. Maine now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. He has a married, has a kid. Yeah. But yeah, for a while he had uh, Bootsies. He, he, got, he got me into widespread panic. Oh, cool. Here we go. I'm so, so jealous. But yeah, <laughs> Randy Rucker. So he is big into what's called the only here, only now food scene. Yeah. Where the you go to a restaurant and it's not so much a menu as much as you give them 50 bucks and they bring you what they pre prepared that day using the local foraged plants and wild game and things like that uh for a meal that could only be served in this small window of time in this small window of like place that, without that day and date and whatever right. is available yeah. and yeah weather conditions and all that sort of thing so whatever he saw at the farmer's market that he liked you oh not even that he had a farm or his mom had a farm in tomball and that's so right he would yeah. forage his stuff there yeah and then i worked with him a few times on that uh one of the discovery channel or one of those actually approached me they were going to have a well, what they said is they, they wanted uh, teams to go out in the wild for a week and gather stuff and then cook a meal for it and to try and wow the judges. And so he and I sent in a video application to this and we were turned down. And I found out through some other grapevines, I'm in contact with people like from Alone and, and Naked and Afraid and so forth. And uh, what the plan was is they were going to take these foragers and basically recreate a most dangerous game sort of thing where the foragers would be hunted and chased and you know constantly on the run for three or four days while trying to gather the stuff and then cook the meals and the word is that they were really afraid that a couple of good old texan boys would fight back <laughs> fight back and you know, the 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 term that was <laughs> was uh given to me was what they were really looking for were some drum banging earth mothers that could be 
uh, terrorized and, and that's nice. Yeah. yeah, and so it's like, yeah, you know what? That's, that's the most terrifying book. It's really only one of the only ones I remember from my childhood. That's, that's terrible. The most dangerous game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, I get so. it. I get bummed out as a jam band. Grateful Dead fish guy. I don't like being terrorized like that. Yeah, We're nice yeah. nobody wants to be yeah. terrorized. Yeah, yeah you would think, but yeah, it's but, but that the is so audience television though. exactly. <sighs> so that, yeah, so like so having a restaurant. I mean, so Randy did that obviously, right? So I, is there anybody? I know that there's so a, different there's ones like. There's Coltivare in the Heights, and they have, uh, I don't know if they still do with COVID, hopefully, but their backyard sort of like they right. have vines with veg with uh, mm -hmm. tomatoes and stuff like that. So there are elements of that here in town. Yeah. And even in the woodlands, there's Urban Beats, like H-E-R-B dash N B-E-E-T-S. That's pretty cool. And they have... <laughs> urban beats but they have some grow beds and stuff out front where they do the thing and yeah there are a number of places that will at least grow some of their greens and stuff like that at this point i don't know uh well okay i don't know any restaurants that are doing this but i am teaching a number of foraging and cooking classes so coming up later in September, uh, I will be at Houston Botanic Gardens. I have to put it on the website yet. That's one of my things today, where I will be teaching students how to make a wild green infused pasta. Mm. So you, you, you mix up. You know, well, at, at this point, no, we're talking the pasta itself. So the pasta oh. is infused with the plants and then we're going to, you know, send it home with them and they, you know, with some different recipes and they can do, you know, whatever sauce they want. But that's one of the great ways of, you know, sneaking all sorts of different wild plants into your, diet. you know, your yeah. diet, your kid's diet, your spouse's diet, whatever, you know, some different flowers and so forth. Uh, in October at Cato Mounds historic site up in near Athens, Texas, uh, I have a long history from with them. We are doing an all day event where the morning will be out collecting the wild foods and then the after or the, the midday will be spent cooking them. And then at the end, we will uh, be feasting upon our, our stuff. So I got a is there, thing there. Are there. Is there a lot of stuff left over from, you know, the earliest peoples that were in the Houston area that's still around or has just modern technology sort of Sweep, swept that under the rug. Yeah. Is that not here anymore? Okay, back in time. Back yeah, to Merlin. Merlin. <laughs> yeah. So when you talk about East Texas and West Texas, where was the dividing line? Do you know? I don't. I would say the hill country. Buffalo Bayou. No kidding. Oh, wow. Buffalo okay. Bayou. East of Buffalo Bayou was the piney woods sort of thing. Mm. Yeah. And then West was the prairie and turning into the hill country. So the arrival of Western people in there completely changed it. We planted all the trees. We, we expanded, uh, you know, all the oak trees and stuff. That's that. Well, OK, there's also a question like when you say native, at what period yeah. and back, you know, because there's yeah. again, like everywhere else, there's waves of change that occur depending on, you know, who's there and who isn't there. But there are native plants still around but there is also an equal number of native to other parts of texas you know more east texas native more west texas native that have been that moved. Have, that landscaped in here yeah. mm -hmm. and then a lot of the weeds being a a shipping area I and mean, we get oh. the you know the cargo ships from all over that means we also get seeds and invasive species from all over the world so we have a lot yes. of of seeds and 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 weeds that are non-native to north america that mm. have decided hey i really like it okay here's an example do you like thai food i do yes all right you know that that mint they usually have on the plate there it has gone rogue it absolutely loves the surrounding areas houston and the sam houston national forest and davy crockett our wild areas are being overrun with that. Is that because, because somebody went to the bathroom somewhere after eating it? Or is that because- More likely because someone said, this is really things? good. They took the cuttings home, stuck it in some water. Mints are really good at okay. rooting. They planted it in their garden and then kaboom. Actually, that makes more sense because <laughs> than, than the other, Yeah. because mint in general is like prolific, right? Yeah, very. It grows everywhere. 
Well, I was I, mint is one of those things too, especially with Vietnamese food. Um, th- there's a lot of one of the things that always attracted me to Vietnamese food when I was younger was just that that array of flavors. Going back to the Thai thing as well, but yeah. there's so many elements of things like rosemary. Um, I can't think of anything else right now. My brain wow. is fogged. Yeah. But just even peppers, like onions, that. you know the yeah, all that. From, it's funny, from a medicinal onions, point. Uh, the there's mint funny. made me. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Craig. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say that you brought up onions. There's, uh, I have some landscaping over here by my apartment, and it smells like a lot like onion. And I guess it's like wild green onion, maybe that yeah, looks probably. like it looks decorative, but it smells just like my, when my grandpa would grow green <laughs> onions in there in the yard. Mm-hmm. I smell that. Is that so, green onion? I guess. Yeah. So that- in Texas alone, we have 14 different species of native onions. <laughs> Native wild That's onions great. that look like little chives. They have different yeah. structure, minute, you know, structural features. But if you think about it, Texas actually has between 11 and 14 different ecological zones. We are one of the most diverse yeah. ecological you know, yeah. things. And we have an onion for each one of those zones. And usually there can be some overlap from them. Are and they then all on edible? top, yeah. Okay. And on top of that, we also have some naturalized ones. Like there's one called field garlic. Uh, yeah. Allium vanille, a garlic with a CK, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so it it well, it depends on who's spelling it, but it's like it. a wrapper, okay. but it's, the wrapper it's, onion. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it still looks like you know a wild onion. It has the bulb, um, but it does have the the paper wrapping around it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it loves Houston. It actually has been naturalized all over the world. Um, Can that be used as a substitute yep. for other things? Okay, one hundred percent. Yep, it's okay. just another chive. So he used to. We man, are chive that, state. Chive. Yeah. That, that guy used to. Grandpa Lavati used to. When we would go out to his land out near El Campo, he. I, I come to think of it now, he was doing a lot of foraging, but I don't think that he was really advertising it, because he would just like pick stuff off the ground and tell me, "Oh yeah, we can eat this." Or when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, when he was, you know, child of immigrants, you know, like, I guess they learned about a lot of that stuff and brought that here yeah. from from uh, from the Czech Czech world. And oh, yeah. They would bring it over here. And he was the one that taught me about honeysuckles. He was the one that taught mm-hmm. me about berries. He was the one that would pick something off the ground and start chewing it. And I'd be like, smell, it tastes like onions. He's like, yeah, it's onion. Mm-hmm. And it was like, it was, I'm sure my grandmother loved it, you know, <laughs> that he was constantly just eating onions, you know, pull it up off the ground. Uh, <laughs> you know, going back to... Um, Trying to go full circle, hill, full circle here. You know, you brought up in the Great Depression that you had family members and relatives that were sustaining their own families with things like that. Um, that is just that to me is very inspiring. That I guess humankind we find a way mm-hmm. to to keep ourselves around just by using the things that are naturally growing, and yeah. that is something really cool that ties into the museums. Uh, I think message as well, you know, that there's Mm -hmm. things around us that can sustain us. Mm -hmm. And I try and convince people to get at least 10% of their diet from the wild. Just learn. (laughs) That would be a big challenge though, really. Not not, Well, if you're living in an apartment, maybe, but if you're in suburbia, (laughs) not so much because not everyone is doing it. So I have an agreement with all my neighbors. They don't put down fire ant killers or things like that. And I keep their yard free of weeds and, you know, (laughs) That's I'll awesome. sauerkraut it if I want to store it. Ooh, that or, sounds good. Oh yeah, I need sauerkraut now. Do you do no. you ever when you're out do when you're out doing foraging, especially like in an urban area, do people ever ask you what you're doing or like <laughs> that man's crazy? That that, oh, that the huge time. man, yeah. that huge man with the mohawk is crazy. What's he doing? <laughs> so one of the really funny things that started up was when the Pokemon Go became mm. popular. <laughs> and I'd be crouched down looking at a plant and suddenly there'd be a swarm of people. What do you got? What do you got? <laughs> With their phones. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't see it. And it's like, awesome. I'm looking at a plant here. And then we'd have an impromptu, you know, foraging class and they loved it. So uh, thank you, awesome. Pokemon Go creators. You gave me a, a well, way. Of- you know, that's funny you brought that up because I do know um, in the Pokemon Go sort of thing, got people outside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was a strange byproduct of something that, you know, it's just usually just for building up, you know, uh, building up your, I don't know. I had friends yeah. that did it all the time. I didn't understand it. Yeah. Me either. But it also, I, I mean, you'd see people in the middle of like um, parks. And yeah. I remember just Discovery Green at one point downtown <laughs> had to shut down the park and say, hey, look, we're a private park. You can't be here at three o'clock in the morning trying to look for, <laughs> 
you know, yep. Charizard or whoever. <laughs> you can't be doing that. But yeah. it also got people outside. Right. And it also got people, in your case, looking on the ground and going, OK, what yeah. is that? That's it's, cool. That's a cool byproduct of technology. Mm-hmm. And you both mentioned earlier on that you always were intrigued by the idea of foraging. I have found pretty much everyone is intrigued by the idea of foraging. There's a few naysayers every so often, you know, I'll, I'll get someone come on my Facebook and say, ah, you know, you're hurting the plants. You're a crazy person. We get food from a grocery store. Like you know, normal, you're <laughs> like freak. that's not hurting. That actually does. Yeah. Actually getting you know, food from a grocery store is less natural. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In most but, cases. And my response is you go guy, you know, you eat all those ding dongs and drink all that Coca-Cola. <laughs> I'm sure it's in our <laughs> DNA, like at a very base level of survival that that's an adaptive behavior to be interested good, in that good point good point yeah, yeah like your our dna is basically it's set to where we look at our look at the world around us and go okay what can we eat yeah mm-hmm. you know or what, can what we resources are available yeah. to me and that was the secret to this the, the how far the human race has come because we are problem solvers we look at yeah. things and say okay this is what is what can i do with it to make my life even better Yep. The trial and error too. Somebody had to eat that bark off the tree to figure out whether or yeah. not it was bad. What about tree bark? I saw you in a picture on your Instagram. Yeah. So uh, I, that's another thing that's been intriguing me about your your social media <laughs> platforms. Okay, so let's talk about that. I love getting history involved in this and using real world historical examples. Uh, so World War II. Europe is destroyed. At the end of World War II, Europe is destroyed. There's no farms. So the US and Canada were shipping over tons and tons of loaves of bread to try and give the Europeans the calories they needed. We could not meet the calorie demand until someone remembered, oh, hey, uh, beechwood and uh, pine bark and elm wood has a digestible, measurable amount of calories in it. Mm. So they started taking the beech wood, the pine wood, uh, the elm wood, grinding into sawdust, mixing that in with the loaves of bread and sending it over to Europe. So looking at pine, the inner bark, the cambium layer of pine has between 500 and 600 calories per pound, which sounds both big and low. So, but uh, to eat it, you can't just start peeling it off and start chewing on it because your stomach is no longer adapted to it. Right. So if you're going to eat the pine bark or any of the other parks, the best thing to do is peel it into very thin layers about potato chip thickness level, roast it. So roasting it helps break down the starches and break down the other things in there. It's like pre-digesting the food. Cooking is, mm-hmm. a, is pre-digesting the food. And then chop it up into small pieces with lots of surface area and then basically boil it or soak it in a lot of water and eat it like a porridge or an oatmeal is generally the best way of doing that. Because then you have the water your body needs to, you know, do all the chemical reactions that it needs uh, and you keep it soft. That's some special forces (laughs) talk right there, man. It is like humans for 82,000 generations. If you go into Finland, there is still the pine forest up there with these giant, you know, old, old, old pine trees. And they use what's called the window painting method where, you know, you're taking the cambium layer. So that's the circulatory system of the tree. So if you completely ring the tree, you put a tourniquet on the tree, it's going to die. So what they do is they cut window panes in the tree as high as they could reach about eight to 10 inches across, then down to about knee height and then back over and peel these you know, one big rectangular piece that overall is maybe one sixth of the surface area of the outer side of it. So you have most of the circulatory system still going. So one year they would take it from one side, the next year they take it from the next side, the next year they take it from another side, the next year they take it from the other side, and then they would wait a year and start the process over. Give it a rest so, one year completely. Yeah. And then, so, yep. So there have been the trees up there that have been harvested in this way for hundreds of years, the same trees, because it's done in a sustainable manner. And that is always the trick. One of the things I'm I'm religious about in my classes is the rules and ethics of foraging and how Mm -hmm. to do it in a sustainable manner. I tell people, if I feel like my work 
has led to destruction of Texas ecosystems, I'm shutting it all down Mm -hmm. because that is not what I want. I want people to understand the miracles that are around them, but not to the point of going overboard. That's a big problem in places like California and New York, where there are restaurants that pay good money site, you know, just no questions asked, open the back door, here's a bag, here's the cash. And it is decimating the parks there. And yeah. they're there. They are starting to think maybe we need to put laws in place, kind of like what Texas has. So, yeah. so sort of save some miracles for the next generation. Exactly. Yeah. So sustainable. Yeah. So it's like okay. one of your ethics, sustainability, and then yeah. what is safe and what is good. So like kind of a three prong. Yeah. So what, what I, I, I teach there are, as a forger, there are four things you need to respect. You need to respect okay. the law. You need to respect the land. You need to respect the plant and you need to respect yourself. And I go into a little more detail in each one of those. Yeah, let's, I'm, I'm seeing it right now on uh, the foragingtexas.com website has so many. I mean, like I said, I was on this on these, <laughs> this thing for hours just sort of checking no. this stuff out. And it's just it's so um, intensive and not to not to scare anybody away. But but Meriwether really knows his stuff. And you you read through that and it starts bringing up so many different ideas. You start remembering as you, as you were a child, things you probably saw. And it does and go to, back to Kat's point here. And I'll stop pontificating, I promise. <laughs> but we do have a lot of this stuff ingrained in our DNA. You know, mm-hmm. there, are, there are, in many cases, there are natural remedies for basic ailments that we have that are annoying, that there are uh, solutions or at least salves for them out there in the wild. Yeah. Well, uh, and you- really, yeah. If, I, if I can say, we are prehistoric bodies trying to live in the modern world. So we are not doing and experiences a lot of the things we experienced in our caveman times, Mm -hmm. which is responsible for a lot of our lifestyle health issues, the high blood pressure, depression, attention deficit disorder, circulatory diseases, all these are diabetes. Mm -hmm. All these things have ways of helping both lifestyle changes. I mean, everyone's told you got to do this, but they aren't told why they got to do it. It's because right. that's how we evolved. That's how our ancestors live their lives. Uh, and the the evolutionary effect is still with us. Yep. So like with it, Medicine it Man Plant Co. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah, hasn't. I was, to, I was about to bring up, yeah, your your website, the other website, the medicinemanplantco.com. You have, it looks like you have tons of uh, different pills and dietary supplements that have been synthesized, Eight. I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, not Sorry. grown and blended. Yeah. There we go. Synthesized is a bad word. Sorry, yeah, yeah, too, yeah, much, yeah. too much science here. Yeah. It's been grown and blended, and you guys can check out that website. There's plenty of interesting things on there, too. Just yeah. like and I said, the only uh, thing that helped me when I was pregnant and I was very sick, I had nausea for almost nine months. Ginger? And actually, it ended up being mint. Okay. In, in a Another tea, good one. Yeah. And it worked better than the pills that cost my insurance company $25 each that were, I stopped taking those and just started drinking uh, an herbal tea blend that mm-hmm. one of the You're ladies. You're singing Mary Weather's favorite tunes. Man. You well, are. One of the, you one are. Of the that's, homeschool that's... families here were the ones that gave it to me. Oh, you know, cool. They were into that. And so that yep. that's kind of fun and it worked better. Yeah. But there's this belief that science is better than wild stuff. And wild stuff is science. Though, there, right? Yeah. And that's one of my things. As a scientist, I have a master's in medicinal chemistry, a PhD in physical organic chemistry. I, If I'm telling someone use this for that, I need that scientific background. Otherwise, I feel right. fraudulent. Yeah. You know, so. Fair enough. I think so that's true. So all the true. thing, if you go to my products, you know, I list all the compounds that are in the plants and what science has found and links to it. Yeah, you and, don't get that everywhere. There's, you know, you don't get that. Uh, yeah. There's that element and it's coming directly to a lot of the, the things that are in your your products that come from local, that's locally sustainable. So uh, a lot of, so what I try and do is I try and use three or four plants from different parts of the world. Going back to the evolutionary thing, for the last 800 years or so, there's been a lot of globalization. And it's been found that having a mixture of different plants from around the world, you're more likely to find the two or three key ones that help a particular individual. Mm -hmm. And so I do that. And so we try and get the plants from the particular original country, you know, Poland or Africa, you know, right. South America, the Maca, you know, things like do, that. Do people, um, if, depending on your genetic background, do you find that people are more receptive to certain 
uh, byproducts from that era. Like, like if I, like my family, mostly Spain and Europe, would I be more inclined to use that kind of stuff? And that would be better for my yes. bloodline. In fact, there's two really good studies on that. One involved Greece or people from Greece and the other involved people from Okinawa, Japan. In both the Okinawa, Japan and in Greece, you have a high percentage of people that make it past 100 years old. And a lot of that was due to the specific diet, the specific foods they were eating, mm -hmm. high in herbs, high in fruit, high in seafood, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, but what they found is if they take someone that didn't evolve there and gave them that same diet, they did get some benefit, but they didn't get the huge right. benefit of that. So there is that genetic component of if you're a pure, and in this case, the Okina, they were still the pure, and in Greece, they were still the pure, mm -hmm. but most of us are not. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so that's why I go with that mix, you know, hoping there's, you know, usually at least two things that really tie, sing to your DNA and, 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 okay. and make it do what it's supposed to do. I'm hoping mine's not Ludafisk because oh, I'm 100% yeah. Northwestern European. I was like, oh, what does that tell me? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Growing up in Minnesota, I'm familiar with this. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you are. That's why I brought it up. Oh you. Lord. Not, and not I will and, and <laughs> some of that stuff you do, I do notice, like especially with ginger, it revitalizes you. You know, mm -hmm. if you get ginger, especially in the raw, I'm not talking about the, you know, the sliced ginger you get at the at the sushi yeah. place. I'm talking about real live ginger. Yeah. That stuff can be a natural stimulant. I don't mean stimulant like you know, can like of caffeine bang or something or a Red Bull, but more of like it's a Open, opens it's up a, your senses. So, yeah. yeah. So it's funny you you because yesterday I did a podcast uh, where it was all about ginger in particular for uh, pregnant women and new mothers mm -hmm. and how the ginger helps there. And so th there's basically three forms of if we have time, I can talk chemistry here. Yeah. yeah but yeah, there, yeah. so you have the raw ginger and it has the compound gingerol because chemists don't have any sense of uh, you know imagination, but gingerol. And it that particular molecule is very similar to capsium, the, the capsaicium, the, the, the hot molecule mm -hmm. in peppers. And it has similar effects on that way. If you dry it, it turns into a different form that becomes much more pungent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like if you want to open your sinuses part, if you want that yeah. feature of it, you want to go with the dried ginger. If you are having problems with uh, constipation or digestion, in that case, you want more of the cooked ginger. And uh, what it does is it it the alters. yeah it alters it into some molecules that actually kind of well they do two things one they mimic the action of certain digestive enzymes so they help break down food more quickly it also triggers uh the smooth muscles along the intestines to do the squeezing thing they need to pass things along so it was used as a constipation cure peristalsis peristaltic action yeah uh, okay uh, yeah Yep. Squeezy. Squeeziness. <laughs> Squeeziness. Um, the all forms of them work on the calcium channels that control you know, chemistry, biochemistry that basically control blood pressure. Uh, so they they help reduce the blood pressure. The ginger, the fresh ginger also uh, is a vascular dilator it opens up your blood vessels that's why sometimes you get that ginger flush because you're getting mm -hmm. that your blood vessels are opening up and so that reduces blood pressure too that's and then on top of that it's loaded with these antioxidants that help convert the bad lipids you know the ldls break them into the good hdl lipids and not only does that work while they're floating through the blood, there's some really good research that if you're taking it every day, it can actually start working on plaque buildup in your blood vessels and start, you know, basically rotor rootering your blood That's or your blood cool. vessels. Yeah. So ginger is one of those things. Yeah. You want about a gram a day. How, yeah, do you, we don't how would you ingest that? How would so you... sprinkled in food as tea, okay. you know, any of the different ways. Okay. They will retain the available... potency. Should we not use that kind of stuff in like at a like in a capsule form, or is it better? Oh, that'll be fine too. Yeah. Okay. So Basically, ginger... if you're taking it, you're gonna get effect. 
It's yeah. better than a pipe snake down your yeah yeah. Well, or I, was, I, was, I was making sure too that it wasn't yeah. something that like if I do get it in a yeah. well, I yeah, definitely no, but, I'm gonna get it from you. So like yeah. you know like definitely it's not something the that blood I wanna, pressure pill. There we go. Okay, <laughs> which actually we're out of because it's become so popular that we we underestimated how how many people uh, want it. I keep it well, frozen I, in my fridge and grated into everything. Yep. I'm a, oh yeah. I'm a sadly I'm a high blood pressure person mm-hmm. and I and I would Me rather too. not take what I am taking every single day to get to I can point. understand so that. Yeah. We're gonna have we'll have a sidebar conversation about okay. that. Same boat, can Craig. Do. I'm can excited do. uh because your class on October second, um just a minute ago I was texting my dad to see what he was doing. <laughs> because I'm really, um, I'm really scared that you and him are going to be best friends. Oh, cool! So uh, <laughs> I guess some of the, the some of the words you're using are the same thing that my dad does. Uh, my dad is one of those. I don't want to call it. I don't know how to say. It, it's like he's sort of like an Earth man, but he doesn't. Uh, but he lives in the city, so he's the one that has. He's a whole, connected to nature. Yeah, and he has he, he has his cabinet in the kitchen at my parents' house, and then my mom has her cabinet, and his cabinet has just a bunch of big, you know, words in it, and <laughs> all kinds of crazy oils and seeds and stuff. So I think that this is going to be a really good class yep. for father and son to wake up early and go oh, to. Oh, it's a bonding oh, class. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So, yeah, that's going to be a Saturday, October 2nd at 9.30. Check out the HMNS.org website. Guys, Meriwether is one of the coolest. We always say that every guest is the coolest <laughs> nah, guest. Cool. But you're you're in the top you're in the top percentile so okay. far. I'm excited. And uh, the class is going to be great. Like I said, and check out foragingtexas.com, medicinemanplantco.com. And where can we find you on social media? Okay, so yeah, on social media, on Instagram, mmplantco. And then on Facebook, the Medicine Man Plant Co. Okay. If you go to the Medicine Man, yeah, if you go to the the main medicinemanplantco.com, it has links to the social media. Mm -hmm. I I do tons of podcasts. I'm I'm trying to do three podcasts a week. So there's links to all those on there. And then plus all my YouTube stuff too. So. And then you're a Meriwether forager on instagram on instagram yeah uh, yeah and and that's the one i've been following okay, for a few weeks yeah. now and it's been yeah i've been trying to transfer more and more over to the medicine man okay okay yeah but, but follow you, know, you everywhere both yeah and that's the best thing <laughs> why not all well i'm yeah. excited uh i'll see you on uh october 2nd and i'm excited to start uh well maybe i can start you know, having lunch outside at the museum but just Heck walking yeah. around get your vitamin d if nothing else <laughs> that's really crucial it there is. you go.